Welcome to the Hope for the Animals podcast, sponsored by United Poultry Concerns. I'm your host, Hope Bohannock, and you can find all our shows archived at our website, hopefortheanimalspodcast.org. And I'd love to hear from you with any questions or comments. Please get in touch with me at my email, hope at upc-online.org. Well, we made it. 2021. (laughs) Woohoo! Let's hope it's a better year. It certainly won't have to try very hard to be a better year, 2021. Uh, So 2020, of course, brought so much strife and heartache and hardship. I thought it would be a really good way to start off 2021, our first podcast of 2021 with another installment of the Glimmers of Hope segment. This is a segment that I started last year. We did a couple of installments, and it's good news stories for animals, good news from around the globe, good things and positive things that are happening for animals that I want to report on for you. Good news just seems to go under the radar these days, especially this year where... There's been just so much bad news, but there has also been good news for animals, and I really want to share with you some of the highlights of the last few months of good news from around the world, because there's been a lot, and and I think it, it helps us move into 2021 with some hope and inspiration, so I bring you more glimmers of hope. Okay, so I'm going to start with a good news story that we have been reporting on here at UPC. There was a conflict that happens in so many communities around the U.S. between waterfowl and the suburbs, basically. (laughs) You know, we build up the suburbs and push out wildlife, and when we create man-made ponds and lakes for our enjoyment, the birds come and want to enjoy them too. But all too often, there are complaints due to noise or droppings or other issues. And in Island Walk, Florida, there was such a conflict with ducks. They were a community of Muscovy ducks, which is a, a large, bre- large breed of ducks. They lived in the lakes in the neighborhoods. Residents found out that there was a plan to trap and kill the ducks, and they raised their concerns through the media and a petition, and UPC has been supporting and sharing their story. Well, we just got the good news that the community's board of directors reversed their decision to round up and kill the ducks, and they're going to try to find a nonviolent way to manage the ducks. So this is really wonderful news for this community of ducks and for the people who care about them. Congratulations to the concerned neighbors who recognized that the ducks are their neighbors, too, who deserve protection in their own homes. So some other recent good news around the environment and wildlife, and, you know, there's going to be a lot of environmental damage and bad environmental policy in the U.S. to undo and clean up from the last four years. But there were some recent bright spots regarding the environment and wildlife, and and I want to feature two important ones here. One was in early December, when the Trump's Bureau of Land Management, the BLM, they pulled out of a proposal that would have opened up 5,000 protected acres to grazing. This was in the Elkhorn Wildlife Management Area in the Rocky Mountains. This is in Montana. And this fight goes all the way back to 2018 when it was first proposed by the BLM to basically burn this sagebrush juniper habitat in this beautiful area and open it up to grazing cows for meat. Luckily, there are some 
awesome lawyers out there and wonderful nonprofits and the Alliance for the Wild Rockies and the Native Ecosystem Council both sued the BLM and the project was put on hold and they cited negative impacts on the wildlife in the area uh, if, if cows were brought in to graze. Livestock grazing has been shown to negatively impact large species like elk by displacing the herds with barbed wire fencing and decreased availability of the forage, the grass and brush that they graze on. Elk calves, too, are are sometimes too small to jump over the fence, and they can get tangled up in the fence, not able to escape, or they starve to death being separated from the herd. So in December of 2020, a judge ruled that the BLM had failed to properly analyze the impact on wildlife. So they finally pulled the proposal. They gave up. So this is great news. It's a huge win. And I want to give a big shout out and thanks again to the Alliance for the Wild Rockies and the Native Ecosystems Council for their years long work on this success, not not only for wildlife, but also another blow to the cattle industry. So really great job. And another huge win that just happened in December was when the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit rejected the Trump administration's approval of the first offshore oil drilling development in federal Arctic waters. This one went back to 2018 as well when an oil and gas driller got permission from the Trump administration to build and operate an artificial drilling island and underwater pipeline that had a really high risk for oil spills in this very sensitive Buford Sea area in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. It would threaten polar bears and Arctic wildlife and Arctic human communities. Again, a lawsuit was filed and the project was put on hold. And just recently, the court ruled that the Trump administration had failed to properly consider the climate impacts on the project. Specifically, the administration had manipulated the economic models to reach the conclusion that the project would benefit the climate. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and the court saw right through that and they rejected the proposal as a violation of federal law. And as always, these good news stories have hardworking and courageous people behind them. And for this one, there were numerous groups working on the lawsuit, including the Center for Biological Diversity, Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, Defenders of Wildlife, Pacific Environment, and they were all represented by the group Earth Justice. So go eco and animal lawyers. This is a really huge win and a huge blow to the Trump administration's war on wildlife. Let's hope that with a new administration and a new year, we won't have to be so much on the defensive with these horrible and destructive proposals. Okay, so continuing our glimmers of hope, I will now shift to a couple of stories, good news stories around fur. Nordstrom stores have announced a ban on selling fur and exotic animal skins. This is huge. They're going to stop selling fur by the end of the year, 2021. Major retailers are really stepping up and getting fur out, and it's long overdue and really great news. I remember organizing protests of Nordstrom's in the 90s for Fur Free Friday. Fur Free Friday was the Friday after Thanksgiving. So this has been an ongoing struggle for decades. And while the credit is given to HSUS, the Humane Society of the United States, for working with Nordstrom's on this final phase and this final decision, this comes after decades of activists and numerous nonprofits educating shoppers and the media about the horrors of the fur industry where wild animals are kept in these filthy, tiny cages and killed in brutal ways like anal electrocution to keep the fur undamaged. It's just unimaginably horrible. So the other good news story about fur, and in the articles that I was reading about this one, it kept saying that this really could be a sign of the beginning of the end of the fur trade. 
And that is that Denmark's Copenhagen Fur, which is the world's largest auction house for fur, announced that it would close its doors by 2022. Copenhagen Fur sells an average of 25 million mink skins a year. Ugh. This announcement came after the Danish government's recent order of the mass killing of millions of mink due to the COVID-19 outbreaks on the fur farms because the mink were contracting COVID-19. So we're seeing some good news come out of those horrible, horribly sad stories. So Copenhagen Fur, the world's largest fur auction house, is closing its doors. I'm feeling more and more confident that I could see the end of fur in fashion in my lifetime, and that is certainly a glimmer of hope. So there is some positive progress to report in Europe for animals, particularly in France. France is taking bold steps forward in animal protection, and they've announced numerous good things for animals starting right away in the new year. Marine parks will no longer be allowed to breed or bring in new dolphins or orcas. France will also be phasing out wild animals in traveling circuses in the coming years. So animals like elephants and tigers and bears won't be living in small trailer cars being shipped by truck and train across the country, beaten and starved to perform. France will also be phasing out mink farming in the next five years. So really a lot happening all at once for animals in France. And part of all this, which I think is really wonderful, is that the French government will be giving 8 million euros, which is about $9.2 million, to help people working in circuses and marine parks find other jobs. So animal trainers and caretakers that will possibly lose their jobs at, with these changes, they'll be able to get training and resources for other jobs. So, wow, go France. That's just a lot of great news. Okay, so now on to some good news about vegan food. The explosion in vegan products is, I mean, it's really astonishing. And internationally, it really seems to be on the rise. And there were just, there were way too many new products just in the last few months for me to list them all here. I mean, things like Hong Kong's 7-Elevens getting vegan options. I mean, just so much. But I did want to highlight some new exciting choices, especially coming out of major brands and major retailers. So here's just a few. Kroger is the largest food supply chain in the U.S., and they launched 50 new vegan products of their on their own line, which is called Simple Truth. It's like an affordable, healthy in-house brand. They now have vegan deli slices and vegan cheese slices, vegan shreds, sour cream, yogurt, cookie dough, ice cream. So last year, they had just a few plant-based options, and they made $2.5 billion in sales on those few items. So they expanded the product selection extensively. So if you have a Kroger's in your area, you should go and check that out, the Simple Truths line. The UK saw some major shifts to vegan-friendly eating. The Brits are really getting on board, really getting on the vegan bus with loads of vegan options coming from major retailers again. So in the UK, Domino's Pizza will now offer vegan chicken on their pizza and also has sides of vegan chicken nuggets. The UK's Krispy Kremes are launching a vegan donut. Hellman's Mayonnaise is debuting three new vegan-flavored mayos in the UK, a garlic-flavored, a chipotle-flavored, and baconaise, a bacon-flavored mayo. Oh, yeah. Vegans, we're, we're, we're so deprived. <laughs> that all sounds so good. And finally, from the UK, a vegan breakfast sandwich at Starbucks. 
I'm so excited for this one. So they say that it's going to have, it's, it's coming soon. It's going to have a Beyond Meat Patty, the company's signature tomato relish, a tofu turmeric scramble, a slice of mature grated vegan cheese. Mm, I'm getting hungry. And, you know, I'm just, I'm really jealous of this one. One of my, I'm jealous that it's in the UK is what I'm jealous of. I wanted to come to the US. One of my favorite treats is a Starbucks soy latte. I don't do it often, but pre-pandemic on a long drive to some vegan conference or vegan event somewhere, that would be my treat, getting a soy latte at Starbucks. So being able to grab a vegan breakfast sandwich, that would be fantastic. So bring it to the U.S., Starbucks, please. So continuing with new vegan options from major food companies, this next one is a flashback to childhood for me. Dairy Queen is introducing dairy-free dilly bars. So Dairy Queen was one of my all-time favorites as a kid. I loved that chocolate sauce that, that hardened into a shell on the ice cream. So good. So that's what these dilly bars are. It's vegan ice cream, vanilla, uh, coconut-based vegan ice cream dipped in a vegan version of that crunchy chocolate shell. And they're available across the U.S. and Canada. Yum. So I'll leave it there with the vegan food section. We'll move on. But like I said, there were just so many. There were so many more I could have mentioned. So it's really amazing. It's, it's almost unfathomable how many options are popping up out there. It's it's almost more than a glimmer of hope. It's a bright, gleaming grocery store aisle full of hope. <laughs> okay, just a couple more glimmers of hope stories here, and then we'll get to our interview with Uni. There were two new studies that came out uh, around plant-based eating, and I really wanted to report on them because I think they're very, very hopeful. And one of them is that there was a study that found that plant-based meals are actually, on average, 40% cheaper than meals with meat and fish. This study looked at the diets of 11,000 people, and they found that vegans spent, on average, 40% less on grocery bills than people who include animal products. And also... Vegan dinners were 32% faster to prepare, so cheaper and faster. This is, it, it just completely flips what we generally think, right? Cost is often a barrier to trying new foods, so hopefully this information will put people's minds at ease and debunk some of the common misconceptions that eating vegan is expensive. And I'm sure that there are factors that can make some vegan diets very expensive, but this was on average with a large number of participants studied, so this is really some great news. It, it is important to note and interesting to note that they found that only 3.7% of vegans' grocery bills went to mimicking meats, plant-based meats. And that is where costs can really go up with the vegan meats and cheeses. They concluded that it's actually more flexitarians that are buying plant-based meats and not vegans. So that could account for the lower grocery bills for vegans. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up this Glimmers of Hope segment with a very hopeful study. <laughs> so, so in the last Glimmers of Hope segment, I talked about the massive increase in plant-based meat and dairy sales over the last few months during the pandemic. And the, the sales, of, they've just been through the roof. So this time, I want to report on a recent study that found that 47% of the U.S. population ate more plant-based foods during the pandemic. And that, of course, makes sense with the increased sales, but there were some really interesting findings here. So this is a global study. They polled 28,000 people in 30 countries. And for the U.S. segment, the study asked 2,000 Americans, and, and I'll say that that's, that's kind of a small pool with the hundreds of millions of U.S. citizens. 2,000 isn't huge, so just keep that in mind. But there have been, there's been other polling done in the U.S. and the U.K. that have similar results. So this study found that 47% 
of U.S. citizens ate more plant-based foods during the pandemic. And also in the last seven months, 54% of Americans started eating more fruits and vegetables, 43% ate less meat, 25% either reduced or cut out dairy from their diets entirely, and 23% reduced or eliminated eggs entirely. So that's, it's, it's huge. When they were asked about the reasons for the changes, 53%, so over half, indicated that they had more time now to research healthier foods and diets from being home more. So this was a global study, and those stats I just gave were for the U.S. portion of it, but they did ask 28,000 people in 30 countries. So that's a more significant poll, and some of the global findings were really interesting as well. They found that 62% of people polled wanted to incorporate more plant-based foods in their diet. 46% had become more open-minded about plant-based foods and meatless meats. And this one, this this last one just really is amazing. So again, think about this. 30 countries, 28,000 people, almost half of them, 43%, believe that within their lifetime, the majority of people will be eating plant-based. I mean, imagine that. It's, it's just, it's incredible that half the people polled believed that within their lifetime, the majority of people on the planet will be vegan. <laughs> it just, wow, my heart is glimmering with that one. So I hope you enjoyed these glimmers of hope. And please know that even after the worst year ever, <laughs> good things are happening for animals and for the planet. And we are at a crossroads, but there are positive strides being made and things could change very rapidly if we all do our part and do whatever we can do to help. So please have hope for a better day for animals. Okay, so I want to bring in our guest today. Today we have Uni Namburipad. He is an organizer for justice and compassion for non-human and human animals. He's planned veg fests and investigated animal farms and fundraised for low-income uh, worker organizations and facilitated conversations with men on healthy masculinity. He facilitates wellness retreats in the animal advocacy community, and he serves on the board of directors of Encompass, which is a racial equality and animal advocacy nonprofit. And we're really glad you could be with us here today. Hi, Uni. Hi, Hope. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. Well, I want to start by asking you, you know, I feel that all animal advocates are superheroes, and every superhero has an origin story. So what is your vegan and activist origin story? I know that your family's from India, and your mom was vegetarian. So how did that influence you? And it's probably some of your extended family and ancestry as well uh, were vegetarian. What, what's your story? Well, thanks, Hope. I really like that perspective of uh, really honoring and appreciating animal advocates. I just think that's really healthy and wonderful that you say things that way. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, the, my, my uh, story is, you know, it's the story of my life when, it, when something like this is so important to you. You, you can see how it ties back and everything that, um, that you've done. I, uh, I was born in the United States to immigrants from India. And um, as a child, every few years we would visit India. And as we got older, uh, our parents would leave us in India with relatives uh, for much of the summer. And when I was about 10 years old, my brother and I uh, we were in India and uh, my second cousin, Narayanan, had to befriended a semi-feral cat named Bobby. So my brother and I discovered cat's ability to land on their feet by throwing Bobby higher and higher. Oh. And you know, <laughs> to be clear here, we are not the heroes of the story, my brother. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, um, and as you'll see, Narayan in this. And he said to us, you know, without any shame or blame, that if we keep doing that, Bobby will die. Mm. I was horrified. And, you know, I stopped immediately. 
And, you know, it's that point that I really realized that I care about animals and I wouldn't want to hurt an animal if I could mm. avoid that. Although it took a while uh, for me to do anything about that or uh, think about that further. You know, as you mentioned, uh, my mom uh, is a lifelong vegetarian and all, all of my ancestors uh, were, and so many of my relatives are still vegetarian to this day. But um, as um, westernization, both in my relatives in India and my relatives that came here, um, uh, many have started to eat meat. And so growing up, we ate all vegetarian food at home and we would eat my, my brothers and my dad and I would eat meat outside of the house. Um, I didn't think much of it back then. And so, the, you know, vegetarianism in India is commonly practiced among Hindus and especially among upper caste Hindus. And much of the way that we ex experience religion is through rituals and chanting and prayers and also food, you know, cu customs and uh, cultural practices. And, you know, there's some, there's some nuance and complication here as, you know, here in the U.S., you know, I, I definitely believe and think of um, being vegetarian and being kind to animals as being a forward thinking way of living. Um, but since um, vegetarianism in India is associated, especially with upper caste Hindu families, um, it can often be seen as conservative and oppressive because of its origin. Mm. And so, of course, I think that, you know, it's the best choice uh, to be kind to animals. So during my childhood, I ate meat. And when I was 19, during another trip to India, I decided to become a vegetarian. Um, you know, and I didn't think, I wasn't thinking about cruelty to animals at all or, or my health or the impact on the environment. It just felt right. You know, it was an intuitive connection to my culture. And it was really, really easy to do. Um, I didn't wonder whether I'd be healthy, healthy or what I would eat. Uh, I witnessed many of my relatives as lifelong vegetarians, and they were thriving and uh, doing just fine. Hmm. So I'm, I'm curious about something you said. You said that it can be seen, vegetarianism can be seen because it's connected to the upper uh, caste system uh, as being kind of oppressive. And that's really interesting to me and, and, and shows how as advocates and animal advocates, we really need to be so aware of different cultures and things that we, you know, might not realize. So how did that, how does that work? So that, so, so it's almost like, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure. Tell me how that works. Well, it's a, you know, it's a practice that's commonly done by people with the most wealth and power in society. Right. Mm -hmm. So like the, the Brahmins, the, yeah, the Brahmins. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And so my family is a Brahmin family. Mm. And when something is practiced in that way, then people often see that as restriction or control or the beliefs of the most wealthy and powerful people. And they're, they can be critical of that. Yeah. And I, and I think that it's also, it's, it's complicated. I think yeah. that even among <laughs> sure. Indians, yeah. I think that even among Indians now, you'll, you'll get a lot of different opinions and voices, right? And so yeah. there, there's different perspectives that we can, that we can entertain here. Yeah. And, you know, well, as, I, as, as you said in my introduction, you know, I really care about justice for humans as well. And so looking at these human inequalities and trying to do right by that is important as well. And so that's part of why, what I want to acknowledge here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what I was saying and thinking is that, you know, when we bring our Western ideas of veganism into other cultures, we need to be very sensitive and careful about all kinds of things we may not know about like this. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So long ago, you did an investigation of animal agriculture. Uh, tell us about that. What, uh, what was that like doing an investigation? What farm did you investigate? What did you find? Yeah, so we investigated a local uh, facility that had chickens, uh, egg-laying chickens, and there was about a, a million chickens in this uh, um, facility, and it's, it was maybe about 70 miles from my house, and we would um, go there and uh, take uh, videos and photos, 
And uh, um, was this in uh, Minneapolis? Yeah, yeah, near Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. What we saw was what you see in you know all those videos, but really worse because when you have the smell, when you see you know sometimes rotting carcasses in front of you, and when you were just really present with those animals, you can, you can really uh, notice how incredibly cruel what's happening. You know, and, and I'm I'm sure you're familiar with this. You know, seven or eight chickens in a small cage, all crammed together. They live their entire lives until their egg laying uh, production rates for this, these industrial farms goes down. So it was, it was really terrible. And, uh, um, the, you know, the big challenge, or, w one, of, one of the big challenges of doing these investigations, so we, we didn't, um, this wasn't an undercover investigation. We didn't get jobs at these facilities. Instead, what we did was we would go there in the middle of the night and break into the farms. It was easy. There weren't locks. And we would take um, videos and footage. And eventually, we went public with uh, who we were and what we did. And we faced no legal consequences. I think at least at that time, our senses, the reason we believe that the um, company didn't attempt to have us arrested or press charges is because they thought it was more of a risk to be exposed than it was to try to pro prosecute us. So. Mm. There was no legal consequences there. But the flip side of that is that we didn't get a lot of media attention. Mm. Um, and that was, uh, you know, that was challenging to put all, you know, all this work, you know, very little funding and very little infrastructure. Right. Um, and, and was this in the 90s or early 2000s? This is, yeah, exactly. Right then, right around the turn of the Yeah. And, and I mean, I did similar things at the time and it's, and it was difficult because we didn't have social media. Right. We, mm -hmm. we couldn't tell our own stories as activists can do now. So we relied on media. And if you didn't get the media, then, yeah, you feel like it, you weren't seen or heard. The best thing that did come out of it in terms of exposure is that we distributed some of those photos. And some of the photos were used in vegan outreach literature for about a decade. Wow. Nice. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. It's certainly worth it. Yeah, uh, it's just, it was a little more frustrating back then because we didn't have social media. Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, the, the photos were, you know, seen by millions. So we right. got, we got something awesome. out of it, but also, you know, it, it was a, it was something that now I can tell, you know, that it's my own experience because I really, um, I value my own, you know, self-development and having a good understanding as, you know, as devoted to trying to make change in yeah. our food systems and, for animals to, to really know. So, yeah. And I, what I think I, what's, what's unfortunate in the story that I'm telling you right now is a lack of story of uh, particular individual birds, which knowing what I know now, I would try to uh, learn about the stories of one of these birds and to make them into an individual, you know, and because, you know, all these animals are individuals. And I think it's really important and powerful to tell stories, you know, just like I told that story about Bobby. Yeah. It's, it's so important to really actually go into these places. How you said, you know, that you could, that it's your story to tell and you could really smell and feel, you know, I, I think that's so important. And we did have the benefit of that as, you know, 90s and early 2000 activists when that we could go into these farms and you could just walk right in at that time. It's kind of not that way now, but it is so important to really feel it, to see it, to smell it, to hear it, because even though the videos are so horrible, it really doesn't even come close to the reality of actually standing there and standing in it and, uh, you know, smelling it and seeing it. Yeah, I completely agree, Hope. And, and you're, you're right about that as well. That time was different. It would be much harder to do these same things. And yeah. I think that um, the industry would take us much more seriously. And of course, in many states, they've passed laws to try to prevent people from exposing um, animal cruelty, and there would probably be different results if we attempt to do the same thing now. Right, right. So, Uni, you worked on the National Animal Rights Conference for many years, and this conference has always been very special to me. I love going to this conference. It was, it would go from coast to coast, one year being uh, LA, the other year being DC, and I've gone every year actually since 2004. 
And it breaks my heart that it just fell apart this year. And it actually wasn't because of COVID. There was going to be an online conference, but it was because of what I think is a larger problem in the animal rights movement. And that is a resistance to anti-oppression work, a resistance to embracing diversity and equality and inclusion. Can you talk about this and what you think needs to happen as a movement going forward? What do we need to see in future conferences? Yeah, what was your experience with this? Thanks, Hope. And you know, I realize, I think that we met at one of the conferences. Uh, That's where we met, yes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember which one even, yeah. And I, yeah, I have that feeling too. I, I think I've described it as a family reunion of you know coming home. And I, I've been involved in so many ways in the conferences. I've attended, exhibited, volunteered, I've spoken at the conference. And then in 2019, I served on the program advisory committee and also I managed the moderators. Yeah, so the conference is so important to me. Yeah. Um, and I've also attended other animal advocacy conferences and Compassion and Action for Animals hosted a, a few conferences about 10 years ago. And, you know, it's, it's so important for developing healthy relationships. And as I mentioned, that's really important for, you know, to spread learning and, and fostering collaboration. So this year I was tasked with leading the equity advisory committee for the conference. And yeah, so it was really uh, difficult to see the conference fall apart. And I think, you know, to move forward with this conference and with other conferences, right? So it's not, it's not just the Animal Rights Conference. We need to center equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I think it's both the, way, the best way to make conferences both more inclusive and also more powerful. And I also think that it's a natural extension of having compassion for all living beings, that when we hear any individual talking about you know, their oppression or their marginalization or their suffering, that we listen to that and we respond with compassion and we try to rectify the situation. So I think this is a consistent ethic that aligns with uh, veganism. And, you know, there's so many different ways we can do this. We can bring people in from other movements to learn about other causes. Um, we can have diversity in our speakers and award recipients. And, and we can create policies and procedures to deal with harassment. And not just have policies and procedures, but also have open conversations uh, to create the norms and have those conversations with exhibitors, speakers, volunteers, conference staff, and sponsors. So I hope that future conferences will take this work on. And you know, I, um, as somebody who's been involved both in animal advocacy and many other causes, I know that sometimes animal advocates, there can be this feeling that well, why don't these other causes care about animals? You know, why are, you know, you go to a human rights conference and they're serving animals. And, and you know, what I'll say to that is if we show um, our solidarity with other issues, um, well, that's the, probably the most powerful way to inspire reciprocity and, yeah. and get people to see that animals animals matters as well, right? And so, you know, and that the example of bringing somebody from some other cause to speak at an animal advocacy conference, you know, maybe if somebody does that, they'll learn something about animals, right? Yeah. And then it might be more likely that we get invited into their spaces. Right. And yeah. then we develop relationships with them. And then, you know, maybe they'll be open to having uh, vegan food at their conferences and, and starting to, you know, have conversations about speciesism. And, you know, I, I know that this is frustrating and it's slow, you know, and we want more, but uh, in people who are working on other issues, they, they have, you know, their, their own strong passions about why they're doing what they're doing. Um, we can acknowledge that and we can, um, and, and we can make room for that. And so when we, when we approach things with, uh, with a sense of we are going to be in solidarity with them, then I think we might be seen more. Yeah. Um, and I really see my work because I, you know, I'm, I'm more, I, I've done more in animal advocacy than any other movement of really trying to foster this growth within our movement. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for me, being vegan is about having compassion for everyone. And that to me, includes humans. I mean, recognizing and empathizing with human oppression and suffering. It, it, it's no different to me. 
even though my focus is on animals, I, I just don't, I don't understand the resistance, you know, uh, and the conflict. It's, it's very frustrating. So I, I appreciate the work you're doing and with the work that Encompass is doing. I know you're on their board and I don't know if you want to speak a little to, about your work with Encompass. Yeah, with, with regards to Encompass, what I'll say in, in the conferences is that, um, you know, please follow our work, see, see what we're doing and learn from that. You know, we're, we're engaging the animal advocacy movement in uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. And I think that uh, we have a lot of resources and ideas and people and connections that you know, both care deeply about animals and also care about doing anti-racism work. Yeah. So, what 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 does Encompass do? So, Encompass. Um, so, our our um, goal is to create equity in the animal advocacy movement, and we have several ways of going about doing this work, including doing transformational uh, consulting with animal advocacy organizations. That you know, this is uh, deep work to assess uh, where groups are at in terms of equity and help them create equitable solutions. We do. Um, we've done a couple of diversity, equity, and inclusion summits. Um, we have a caucus with people of the global majority. And we use this term because globally, the term people of color doesn't resonate. And, as, and we have found animal advocates across the world that are interested in our work. So we have a caucus that meets monthly to, to help support um, advocates of the global majority. Yeah, and, I, and it is from Encompass that I have learned this new term, the global majority, instead of using people of color. And how it was explained to me is that peop, the, the term people of color, it's not really recognized. It's only in America that we use that, or in the U.S. that we use that. And in other places, it doesn't make sense. Uh, so yeah, it's just, it's fascinating. So I'm, I'm trying to incorporate that into my language now, the global majority. Yeah, it's, it's something that I learned as well and Encompass learned in the process of doing this. Uni, you've been doing activism now for many years. What would you say you've come to believe is the most effective advocacy? Oh, wow. That's a tough question. You know, I, um, in, in, my, in most recent times, I've become really interested in helping animal advocates like discover themselves and figure out what makes them most powerful. There's so many aspects of our own selves that we need to understand deeply to know how to be the most powerful. And it's, you know, it's everything from our, the kind of people we have relationships with, the kind of people we want to be, the, you know, the kind of skills we have, the kind of skills we want to develop, right? Are we outgoing? Are we analytic? You know, do we live in the city? Do we live in the country? What I'm really interested in is, is getting people to just have a much deeper understanding themselves and how to engage. And that's the way to find things that are most uh, powerful. It is important to make your activism sustainable, doing something that you are enjoying and that you do love, uh, or at least like. <laughs> so, you know, you can, you can continue to do it for years to come. Yeah, and, and, and notice one thing I said is not simply who you are, but who you want to be. You know, sometimes you notice in other people, oh, I see that, and I, I aspire to be more like that. You know, that's mm -hmm. something to learn, yeah. right? And it can, be, it can be a great experience if you're like, wow, my activism is an opportunity for me to become more of the kind of person I want to be. Um, you know, a simple example for me is that something I find easy and enjoyable is just having one-on-one -on -one conversations. Something that I find to be very challenging is to do things like public speaking. Mm. Um, and, but what I know is with public speaking is that, you know, there's some speakers that I really enjoy and there's some that I don't like as much. And I think, well, how can I learn to do this and be more like the folks that I really um, like to hear speak? Yeah. And, you know, I've had the opportunity to do that some, and that's been good. And I would say that, you know, now versus 10 years ago, I'm, I'm more comfortable with uh, public speaking. And you're doing public speaking right now and doing a great job. So <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope this feels more like a one on one conversation. Oh, good. <laughs> so easy. I'll try not to think about that. Yeah, thing. right. All the others that are listening. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Okay. So you do work with wellness, and I wanted to ask you about that, about how we balance taking care of ourselves with the, you know, the imperative to help animals and the intensity that that can bring. And, you know, I, I've been doing animal rights activism for over 30 years, and up until just a few years ago, we didn't talk about you know, it just started a few years ago that we started talking about self-care and compassion fatigue, things like that. You know, years ago, we just called it burnout. And, and, and so many people would leave the movement after just a few years, and they were often looked down upon or like they had abandoned the animals or they didn't care enough. And I'm so glad that the conversation is shifting and we are, you know, recognizing that what we do as activists can be traumatic and debilitating. That we have to pay attention to our own mental health more, I think more than certainly most other professions or interests or hobbies if it's if it's, you know, if you're a volunteer. Tell us about your work with that. Well, wow, hope oh, thanks so much. I, you know, I I can see by as you're talking about this, that you have such a great understanding of this. And it sounds like we have some parallels in our paths. You know, for all these years, I, there's a lot of practices I've done for myself to be healthy, like exercising regularly, giving myself uh, time to sleep, really uh, trying to avoid overwork. And I know if I didn't do a lot of these things, I probably wouldn't be in the movement any longer. Yeah. Right. I mean, I wouldn't have this space or time. And so now what I am trying to do is I'm trying to bring what has been my own individual practices that are separate from the movement. That's not something that I was doing within the movement. It was just something that I was doing for myself and trying to bring that into the movement. This retreat I'm planning, which I'll talk about in a moment, it's as much to heal myself as it is to heal other people. And I'm not coming from some kind of perfectly healthy, enlightened place, but rather I'm on this journey as well. And right. And, and I'll ask about that retreat. So you have this retreat coming up yeah. in February called Our Wellness and Liberation, an online retreat. So you can, you can tell us about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I want to create a more powerful movement by helping activists center love and compassion. And also help activists stick with the movement for the long run. To center our love and compassion, I think we need to remember and give space for what you need to remember what gives us hope, what makes us feel whole, and to remember why we have this deep care for animals that we all share. To stick with the movement for a long time, as, as I was mentioning for myself, we can center our health so we can stay in our work. And, that, and that's our health in terms of physical, emotional, social, and spiritual. Mm. So the, the retreat is pretty simple. Um, it's a half day retreat. We'll give you the schedule and some recorded meditations and a talk. And so most of it will be given to you in advance and you can practice on your own. And then we'll gather together briefly over a video conference um, and meditate together and check in. And we'll also invite people to pair up and check in with each other about their own development. So you know, as I mentioned, I'm trying to bring these self-care works into the movement. So it's not simply self-care, it's community care as well. And a, and a few notes, you know, when I say spiritual, I don't necessarily mean in a religious or mystical way, though it can be that. So many people find deep belonging and purpose by secular wisdom practices. And so we welcome people of all religious and spiritual practices and, and those with none. And the other thing I want to talk about too is uh, it's about anger and acceptance. I, you know, I recognize as I talk about this, um, I, I think I could sound like somebody who says, "Oh, stop being so angry," and you know, come to recognize that that's not uh, that's not healthy or good. And mm -hmm. um, I I understand where this anger comes from, right? I mean, we are really upset and, and rightly so about animal exploitation. So what I, what I want us to do is to deepen our understanding of our anger and where it comes from. You know, if we're feeling this, I'm not, I don't want to make assumptions that anybody listening to this feels angry. It's fine. That's fine if you don't too. 
I think um, sadness too, heartbreak is another big one. Yes, yeah. yes. And, and, and the same applies to that as well. I, I say anger specifically because I know that's a, a lot of times in our society and in our movement, we can say, you know, stop being so angry. But yes, you, but you're right. And, you know, and when we pay attention and deepen our understanding of our anger, then we can see what that's telling us. Well, I think that this work, it's really important. And I know so many people that I saw come and go over the years that I think if there had been an acceptance or a a way to recognize compassion fatigue or to have more self-care, that that they might have stayed in the movement. And, you know, it's it's so important that we recognize that and help each other and have that support. So I'm so glad that you're doing this. I, I hope that doing this work of facilitating wellness and, and this retreat will help people get clarity about what they need and that through their activism as they go forward, they, you know, they find that balance that seems right for them. And, and yeah, I and also want to, yeah, the, you know, the, the deep anger and sadness that we can feel and the compassion fatigue, just like you said, that that's real. And it's good to know that we're not the only ones that feel that and, and, and make room for those feelings that we have. One thing I did want to just, I don't know if it's, you know, ask you or mention, but I know you said meditation and just for me, I have tried and failed and tried and worked and with and meditation for, for many, many years. And there are numerous different kinds of meditation. And a lot of people think that meditation really is one thing. And that is just sitting quietly, watching your thoughts, uh, all, all of this, just this, the sitting meditation. But I have found that that really does not work for me. I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I have a lot of energy. I'm kind of a type A and sitting is very hard for me sitting still and meditating. It's never worked for me. I, I maybe will try again in my life, but I've tried a few times. Uh, but what works for me is walking meditation. I love to walk and meditate and it, and it, and it is meditation for me when I walk in nature. So I think that it's just important for people to know that there are different kinds of meditation. And if one isn't working for you to maybe look into another, uh, because it doesn't have to be just one thing. Yeah. Thanks for that hope. That's really important. And I, um, I concur. I, I have, I have, and I do different kinds of meditation myself being raised Hindu, the kind of, uh, you know, what we did a lot of is, uh, chanting prayers, Mm -hmm. which, you know, we didn't call meditation, but I, I do call it now because I yeah. think it, you know it, it certainly is a form of, uh, of meditation. So it's, it's not silent, and uh, I do that now regularly. That's the most common form of meditation I do. I do the sitting meditation some. I also do um, guided meditations. Running and other outdoor activities are, have been have g- given me the same kind of experience that meditation has. So. Um, I, I think of those as being meditation experiences. You know, at the retreat, we'll have a specific schedule and recommendations. And, you know, it's okay to not follow them completely if you are aware of different things that work best for you. Um, then please go ahead and do that. You know, the, the retreat schedule will have in mind somebody who might be new to, to this, and, you know, they can just give that a try. If it's something that feels like it's working for you, then, you know, I advise to continue to try to keep trying to do it. And if not, then try something else. There's a lot of different, uh, you know, what, what's healthy and um, restorative for some people might not be for other people. Yeah. And you mentioned running. You're a runner, right? You, you've done uh, different kind of races. Yeah. I, you know, on and off through the years, I've run all kinds of distances in the last several years, my passion has switched to uh, triathlons. Wow. Um, I know, I know it, it sounds so serious when I say that, but I'm well, no, it sounds fa- um, amazing. Oh, that's right? Incredible yeah. that you can do that. How <laughs> incredible. I love it. So that's, it's running, swimming and biking, right? That's right. Yeah. But uh, you know, it, I think a lot of 
triathletes maybe take it more seriously than I do. Um, but yes, I do all three of those run, bike and swim. And I really enjoy them. I do it outside. I live in Minnesota. So that means I can swim for about Ooh, three months. Swimming in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's um, a couple lakes just a couple miles from that my house. aren't frozen for maybe two months of the year? About three that they're warm. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, oh, my goodness. I, I actually, I, I, I took a dip in, uh, in a lake near my house in November, and that's by far the latest I've ever done, but, wow. not, but not really swimming. Anyway, <laughs> I, I only do triathlons at the end of the summer after I have a chance to train for the swimming portion. Right. Um, wow. Amazing. That's incredible. But, but the running and biking I do all year round and I like the cold weather and I'd like to cross country skiing is my favorite winter activity. So I try to do that as often as I can. Well, you are a very active vegan. I love it. This has been a really wonderful conversation, Uni. We are going to need to wrap it up though. So I want to ask you, what gives you hope for the future? Yeah, there's two things that come to mind. And first, young people. I um, were just really inspired when I meet young activists. Yeah. And right. one of the places I was able to do that was uh, as a camp counselor at the Youth Empowered Action Camp. It's a social justice camp for teenagers. And I did this in 2016 and 2017. And I was just astounded by the teenagers in that. Everything that we're talking about here, Hope, it's like they, you know, it's like they, they held all of that with incredible nuance in terms of caring about human justice, about uh, their own wellness, um, you know, just really kind, loving people. And, and I just really saw the ability from some from these teenagers to lead movements. Mm. I really hope that we can make room for them. Um, so that, that gives me a lot of hope. And then the second is, you know, we've talked a little bit about learning and changing. And I, that gives me a lot of hope because I've been able to change perspectives and see things in different ways by trying to learn and grow and being an activist in a different way. And, and all of this, this whole process uh, feels very hopeful. Mm. Um, and it, it's challenging, right? It, it's been a lot of uh, missteps and a lot of uh, uncertainty to try to do activism in new ways. Um, but it's just very hopeful to keep learning and growing. So it's been a really wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for being with us, Uni. Yeah, thank you. It was, it was really great to do this, Hope. Thank you for listening to the Hope for the Animals podcast. If you see some good news stories out there for animals, please send them my way, and I might use them on a future Glimmers of Hope segment. If you've been listening to this podcast for a while, I want to thank you for your support and for being on this journey with me. And I'd love to hear from you about what you like, what you maybe don't like, so that I can make this year's upcoming podcasts even better. If you are a new listener, welcome, and please check out some of our past episodes. Be sure to subscribe to us on your podcast listening app and add us to your listening library. You can also go to our website, hopefortheanimalspodcast.org, and sign up to get notifications about new episodes right when they're posted. May the new year inspire you to do all you can for animals, have hope for a bright and better year, and please live vegan. <laughs>